thank you so much for coming today. I hope you came with just expectation for God to speak, and I'm so glad you came today. We had a great week, and, and I hope you did also. So we're going to go ahead and open a word of prayer and just ask God to speak and ask God to move uh, in his heart. The teens are in with us today. Uh, they're really excited <laughs> to be in service today. So, But anyways, uh, I'm glad you came. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We are breaking forth in the month of May starting tomorrow. I'm glad winter is wrapping up and I'm anxious for spring and all that comes with it. So we love spring. So, All right, why don't we have a word of prayer? And go ahead and begin. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for tuning in online with us. We love you folks. And we consider you part of the Lighthouse family. And I'm glad you tuned in. So let's open in a word of prayer and begin our service. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to encourage us today. For all those who made the effort to come and meet live in the body of Christ. And even for those that have tuned in online. I ask you to encourage us today with what we're about to hear in the second part of our series, Jesus and We. I ask you, Lord, to do that now. Spirit of God, speak. Receive our worship as we sing to an audience of one, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Sing it out to Jesus.
good to have you worship with us today. It is a, it is a quite a rainy day out there, but it is it's beautiful to be here together with everybody. Thursday is the National Day of Prayer, first Thursday in May. All over our country, believers will be praying, bowing their knee to God and praying for our country and our leadership and asking God to heal our land. Our land is a mess, as many of you well know. Our land is a mess and it can get discouraging, but what we have is we have the power of prayer. And I just come to ask Fedor to come on up and pray for our National Day of Prayer. And just please set a reminder for yourself Thursday that you would remember to bow you. I know we should be praying every day, but specifically please pray for our country and our church and that we would be faithful followers of Christ. So, yeah. Fedor? Sure, sure. Let's uh, bow our heads and as, uh, let's close our eyes and I'd ask for you to certainly consider on uh, that day of prayer to, to do that. Right now, what I'd like to pray about is just our church and, um, you know, the, the specifically, I'm going to focus in on our, our teens because they are just so in my, in my thoughts. Uh, I get to teach them. It's a wonderful thing. And so they're on my heart. So let's pray. Uh, let's pray for them. I ask you to follow along in your heart, in your spirit, as, as I pray. Lord, um, yes, we will certainly remember the, the, the whole outside world, politicians and our country and, and different things like that on the National Day of Prayer. But today, uh, I just want to focus on our teens and just thank you for each one of them, the opportunities to have uh, access to their lives, to their hearts, and to their minds, and to plant seeds from your word, not from my words, not from our clever sayings, but from your word. Plant those ideas, your spirit putting them in their minds, in their hearts, and then waiting for a future harvest. And Lord, we just pray that uh, your word would, would just penetrate their, their thoughts, their morals, and as they establish uh, and, and begin to, to look into the future, growing up, uh, relationships, all kinds of things, futures, school. Um, Lord, please guide them. Lord, please continue to, to use their parents, their, their loved ones, um, to be a godly influence. This church to be a godly influence in their lives so that when they uh, depart from here, uh, the word would not depart from their life and that they would continue uh, to, to grow up to be strong, powerful soldiers for you. We love you, Lord. We pray for them and for these families here who are doing a wonderful job shepherding their own. We love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The teens are worth praying for because we are going to be handing everything off to them at the blink of an eye. So you pray for them that God would raise up leaders among them and become that they would become champions for Christ. So they are going to go everywhere in this world. So you pray that they take the name of Jesus with them. So. All right. I have some notes for you if you'd like to remember and take some notes uh, about today's message. I'm glad you came today for those that, even those that tuned in online, welcome. Uh, we are in part two of our series called Jesus and We. We're looking at four different value statements, four different values that uh, are important to the scriptures and important to Lighthouse. Four different values. There are, lot, there are more than four, but we've selected Four. Last week we acknowledged that it was in part one, we acknowledged that we desire to be faith-filled believers. Faith-filled believers, and we talked about uh, if God answered every one of your prayers that you prayed in the last two weeks, what would be different in your life? And honestly, some were kind of shocked. I had three or four calls that someone listened in online and they said that was really, really good. They said that bothered me that as they reviewed their life that hardly anything would be different in their life. And that kind of 
that kind of disturbed them, they said. So, anyways, last week uh, we acknowledged faith-filled. We want to be faith-filled believers. Today our title of the message is, is this, Spiritual Contributors. Spiritual Contributors. So if you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn your Bibles or your phones or whatever you have to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 in verse 31. We're going to start there. John chapter 4 verse 31. We're going to look at these verses and then we're going to launch into our second we statement. Uh, we had a we statement last week. We'll have uh, we statement number two today. So in John chapter 4, these words were spoken right after Jesus encountered the woman at the well. So if you could picture the woman at the well, these words were spoken to her and, and to the disciples. Uh, mainly to the disciples, these words were spoken. So in John chapter 4, uh, that they were spoken right after Jesus encountered the woman at the well. So he offered her living water, if you can remember that. He asked her and he said, I can give you water that you'll never thirst again. And she goes, wow, you can, I'll take that water. Uh, because shortly from now, a few hours, I'll be thirsty again. She wanted the water, she'll never be thirsty again. The disciples then returned from town that they were going to buy food and were concerned about Jesus' state of hunger. Because they were all, they haven't uh, eaten, and, and they were concerned about Jesus' state of hunger. And uh, so in, verse in verse, chapter 4, verse 31, it says this, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him. They urged him, Rabbi, eat something. I said, eat something. But he said to them, this is how he responded to them. He said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food like a happy meal or something? Could someone brought him some food while we were gone? And that's what they thought. Could someone have brought Jesus a snack while we were in town? Because honestly, everybody was hungry and, and they went into town to get. Jesus responds then in verse 34. It's kind of interesting. Interesting in this way, but like it's because uh, they didn't understand. It's honestly, it's kind of heady understanding here. It's not just like common, easy understanding. But Jesus responds in verse 34. And Jesus says to these guys, they're talking about food. And he says, my food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He goes, that's what my food is. Jesus said that his nourishment, that is, it's different than just loaf of bread and some fish and that type of, and some hummus or whatever. He said, most everyone thinks about, uh, I'm hungry, fill me. Where are we going to eat after service? Most everybody thinks about, fill me. Jesus says, what actually feeds and fills him is to pour into the lives of others. That's what he was saying there. What actually feeds him is to pour into the lives of others. He goes, that's kind of my food. He goes, it's kind of food that you guys know nothing about yet. So, also he said, it's to do the work of God. To do the work of God. That's what he was telling them. Uh, he said, I have food that you know nothing about. Now, it's not that it was impossible for them to understand, but honestly, most people's bellies, uh, when they get hungry, I know myself. Uh, I look forward to, honestly, I'll, as soon as we leave here, I say, Donna, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Well, let's go grab something. And she goes, well, I have this at home. And I'm saying, oh, let's... <laughs> So I got food on my mind too. So, <laughs> but anyways, the disciples were concerned about their next meal. Jesus wasn't concerned with consuming. With consuming, he was concerned about contributing. 
That's what he was telling them. And he said, you guys don't really understand that. So he was concerned with contributing. What he did for others actually nourished him even beyond the ability to understand. That's what he was telling them. Even beyond the ability to understand. And that nature, that nature that Jesus is talking about here is not so appealing to us even, the human being. Not, it's not so appealing. To some it is, but to many it's not. It goes against our human nature. It goes against the core of who we are. The core of who we are. In our world today, people say all the time, they do, they say all the time, we are just good people. We are just good people. And many churches would say that. We're just good people. <coughs> By golly, we're just good people. Folks, that is simply not true. That is simply not true. The Bible says that we are sinful people. Sinful people, we by nature are self-centered and selfish people. By nature, we are. 50 years later, I heard one man say this. It was, a, a, uh, it was a, you know, about what a company will do for customers. What a company will do for customers. One man said this, companies promote quality, value, style, service, selection, convenience, savings, performance, experience, low rates, friendly service, brand, name brands, easy terms, affordable prices, money back guarantee, free installation, free admission, free appraisal, free alternate uh, 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 alterations, uh, free delivery, free estimates, free home trial, and free parking. No cash, no problem, no kidding, no fuss. No must, no, uh, no, no risk, no obligation, no red tape, no down payment, no entry fee, no hidden charges, no purchase necessary. No one will call on you. No payments or interest till September. <laughs> Don't forget to pick up your free gift. A classic, deluxe, custom design, luxury, prestigious, high quality, premium, one of a kind pencil holder. Yours for the asking, no purchase necessary. Why? It's our way of saying thanks for being our customer. That's brilliant, someone wrote that. I had a hard time reading it. Have it your way. Have it your way. Special orders don't upset us. The customer has embraced that idea in almost every area in our lives. The customer has embraced that and it's just simply kind of become part of our lives. The customer now feels in every area that they are king. That they are king and that's the way it is. What I want, having it my way. Tragically, that consumer mindset, tragically now, that consumer mindset has spilled, has bled right on into the church. Oh, it's great for Burger King, but it has spilled on right on into the church. And that's the way it really is in the year 2023, that mindset. People say this all the time when you're looking for a church. People say this, I've heard this this many times when you're looking for a church. They say that they're church shopping. Mm. They say that they're church shopping. Many also say they can't find a good church. They can't. They're church shopping. They can't find a good church. A church that's right for us. I've looked everywhere. Listen, we've been to 21 churches. And we just can't find a church that meets our needs. Church shopping. Just can't find one. Folks, this is incredibly common in the consumer mindset that exists today. Incredibly common. This is just the way church is in the United States. It's a consumer mindset. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Has special orders done. We'll, what, what do you need? We'll try and be that for you. What do you need? Honestly, 
it's it's that it's and pastors many times submit to it where we're trying to reach people and and we we play along with some of that foolishness but it bleeds all the way all the way from the store commercialism into the church and it's almost like the same thing almost like the same thing the way people do church shopping the way people do church that type of thing it bleeds all the way to the local church last week we talked about being faith-filled believers this week we have another we statement that tells us a bit more about spiritual consumers spiritual consumers think about this we statement just think about this in your notes it says this we are not spiritual consumers we are spiritual contributors mm. the church does not exist for us we are the church we are the church and we exist for the world folks that statement honestly if you would embrace that statement it would change so many things in our lives and the way we understand things it would change everything would you please say it with me as we say that again would you please even if you don't have to mean it just play along and then those that read it speak up okay you say it a little louder those that really mean it so but anyways it said goes like this we are not spiritual consumers we are spiritual contributors. The church does not exist for us. We are the church, and we exist for the world. Listen, we are spiritual contributors. That's, if you've ever wondered what I, why I titled the message that way, it's because of that. We are spiritual contributors. Spiritual contributors. Folks, Jesus taught that our food as believers is to do the work and the will of God. That's what he, that's what he told us to do. The, 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 the work that we are called to do is the work of God, is the work of God in our life. And that, it should, it should, to anyone that names the name of Jesus, it should bring nourishment to your soul. Nourishment to your soul. So, because the church doesn't exist for us. We are the church. We are the church. The church is not brick and mortar. And I know it's confusing because we told the boys, three boys stayed with us last night. We said, okay, we're going to church this morning. Okay, but if you really stick with the meaning that we aren't the church, well, we're, we're already here. Bunk, we're already here. Because we are the church. But we use that all the time and it's, it's okay to use that, but we are the church. The church exists for the world. We exist to bring the light and love of Jesus to the world. The church exists. Again today, I want to ask you, as you think about this, I want to ask you to rate yourself in your notes. Yeah, I, you're not turning them into anybody. This is just between you and the rating system and if you even want to you know you're not even a bad person if you don't want to i understand uh some some wouldn't want to do this and but but please it's always good to evaluate yourself mm -hmm. always good to think about where you think you're at so again today i ask you to rate yourself in your notes one being the lowest a consumer one being the lowest a consumer not a uh, like a store-bought consumer, but it, it, this rating yourself in, in church, so to speak, a consumer, and 10 being the highest, a contributor, okay? Now, don't, please know this, don't circle a 10, that's Jesus, okay? <laughs> if you think you're a 10, just ask someone close to you, they'll tell you you're not a 10, okay, if you're really confused about that. So just ask someone, some of you have nobody to ask, okay, just take my word for it. You're not a 10. Neither am I, neither, I'm struggling with eight or nine, seven, but you're not a 10. So, and also don't circle one, that's Satan. So we're gonna have grace and 
as low as you can go is just two, okay? <laughs> okay. So you're not Jesus and you're not Satan, I'm pretty sure. So anyways, I'd ask you to think about that. We'll give grace and start with two. So uh, let me help. Let me help by just saying this. Please don't be offended this way. I wanted to help you zero in so it's just not a wasted exercise, so to speak. So let me help. If you're atten here, if you're attending Lighthouse here and you're not serving in any ministry and you had a coffee or a Danish, your child was uh, cared for, you taught and they were taught God's word maybe this morning or the last weeks and you've never given any type of offering to pay for heat, uh, AC, etc., uh, electric, uh, curriculum, and loads of other things, I think it's safe to say, I think it's safe to say that you're a two. Okay, you're a two. Don't be mad at me. I don't care if you give yourself an eight. Okay, but just think about that. Okay, just think about that. Then if you're this, you're a consumer. Then if you're this, you, you've driven the teens to camp a couple times and you're serving in whatever way now and then, you're serving in whatever way, and you give now and then, like when the spirit leads, or when the pastor yells or whatever. If you give now and then, uh, when the spirit moves, you might be a four, five, or a six. There you go. You might be a four, five, or six. You determine that. I'm not telling you what to put down. So if you're mad, be mad at yourself. Or be fake with yourself. I don't, it's not, a, not the point. Not the point there. So, and then there are those who really, who really give faithfully. And really, they're wildly generous. And they serve. Almost every week, they serve. They are all in. And there's a difference with people that are all in. There's a difference. They're all in. That's possibly an eight or a nine. Again, you don't have to show anybody. You can tear this paper up as soon as you're done and like keep it secret. So you're not, don't be embarrassed over it. Just, it's a reality check in my own life. As I did some of these things, it's a reality check. That's possibly an eight or a nine. You serve and pray daily for leaders and teachers. You've invited the world to come to Christ. Invited the world. So I ask you to circle a number that you think falls somewhere close to your life. That you think. Not what I think, but what you think that falls close to your life. Please try to be honest. Folks, we are the church. And we're called to reach the world. For Christ. We are the church. So let's close with two easy to remember points. You say we're closing already? Yeah, yeah. There's an eight page, eight pages of these two points, but I thought I'd give you false hope. That's false hope. So listen, we're going to close with two easy to remember points about your gifts for God's church, about your gifts. The first thing in your notes that everyone, uh, that I'd like for everyone to understand is that this, number one, God calls you to serve in his church. God calls you to serve in his church. God calls you to serve in his church. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, he calls you to serve in his church. In his church, not our church. It's really his church. Calls you to serve. Christ followers, you are gifted. Think about this. You are gifted. You say, well, me? Yeah, you. If you name the name of Jesus, God has given you at least, very, at least one gift and ability. And you know you have more than even one, but... But he has given you at least one gift and ability. You are gifted, called, set apart to use your gifts to make a difference in the church. In the church. The challenge in today's world is that many do not, many, many do not understand 
what the church is. Even you at home. I would say maybe you especially, you do not understand what the church is. The church is. The church is not brick and mortar and drywall and lights. The church is this. It's Don, Heidi, Daryl. It's Teresa, Bob, Judah, Tammy, Judy, uh, Jerry, Norma, Paulette, and 70 others. I had to stop somewhere. Don't be mad. <laughs> That's who the church is. The church is never, never a building. I know we use it that way, but it is never a building. The church is God's people. The church is people. I know that we say it all the time that we go to church, but in all reality, we don't go to church. We are the church. We are the church. We use that language innocently. We go to church. That's totally fine as long as we understand, as long as we understand that we are the church. We are the church. And we're here for the world. Each other and the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 says this. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, he, he helps us see how God wants us to use our gifts in church. Romans chapter 12. Think about that. It says, it starts this way. It says, in, uh, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. God has given his followers certain gifts, certain gifts for doing certain certain things well. So Paul's going to list list in this list, he's going to list seven gifts. There are more. There are way more, but he's just going to list seven here. I don't know why he stopped at seven. It doesn't matter. I'm not asking that. Uh, but the truth is there are seven gifts he listed here, and uh, but he lists seven. So he says this. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, we don't prophesy anymore. Actually, that's the gift of a prophet, one that, uh, one that foretells the truth. Foretells, not foretells like what's coming, but foretell, like one that tells the truth. That's what the gift of prophecy is. And then it says, speaking out with as much faith as God has given you. There's people that had, had the gift of prophecy then before the scriptures were all concluded and that type of thing but now we forth tell the scriptures forth tell the truth it says if your gift is serving others serve them well the gift of serving if you're a teacher teach well if your gift is to encourage others be encouraging now these are seven gifts if it is giving Give generously. Everybody's called to give. But there are people with, honestly, that they just can't help themselves. They just, honestly, they feel compelled. They, feel, they are generous, beyond generous. People with the gift of generosity. And if God has given you the gift of leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Seven gifts he mentions here with people. Prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, and showing kindness. Maybe some of you at home have those have gifts that you recognize in themselves, in, in yourself. Seven different gifts that God gives to Christ followers in the church. That kind of leaves us spinning like if you don't know what gift you have. If you are a Christ follower, you have, one, you have at least one gift God has given you. At least one gift. I heard one teacher talk about an apple pie illustration. An apple pie illustration to identify your gift. Some don't have a clue what their gift is. And I heard this, I don't know if you've ever heard it before, but it's the apple pie illustration story that will maybe help you identify your gift in this Romans chapter 12, 7, so to speak. So 
Here's the apple pie illustration. Maybe it will help you recognize your gift or your spiritual gift, even you at home. So it says this, imagine being around the table eating apple pie. Being around the table eating apple pie. That's pretty, just a food illustration. I, like, I love food illustrations. But, uh, and the pie is on the edge of the table. Way too, it's just on the edge of the table. Way too close to the edge. Someone bumps the pie and it falls directly on your lap. It falls directly on your lap and you got pie all over you. The apple pie story. You got pie all over you. So what do you do? This is the interesting thing about these seven gifts. So what do you do? If you say this, that's horrible, and jump up and begin to clean up, if you say, stay, no, stay still. We'll get it. I'll get it. Stay still. I'll clean that pie. Here's a towel. Use my napkin. Here, use my napkin. Use my napkin. You immediately get to work. Maybe some of you have that gift of serving. If that's what you do, I can see that in some of you. I can see that in some of you. You would jump up and immediately, honestly, I, 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 I was uh, at the house. We had all the kids over, 22, you know, 22 in the family. And I, we had a big pitcher, a glass pitcher that we haven't used in years. And we had it full of lemonade and ice and all that stuff. And I grabbed it off the counter and the kitchen's full. And I, I went to pour, I think, I forget, it had cherry, I think cherry Kool-Aid in it. And I picked it up, what? It had eggnog in it, that's right. See how it marked her? Yes. I picked it up and the handle broke off. The handle broke off, we haven't used it in a long time, so. But, uh, and the handle broke off and the pitcher came crashing down on the floor, glass everywhere. And honestly, uh, Lachelle and Ange both charged me. And they said, back up, Dad. <laughs> Now, I don't have the gift. I said, gladly. <laughs> they were on their hands and knees, honestly cleaning. It was, it bounced off the floor and eggnog was on my pants and they were just, just everything. They said, we got this. We got this. And I thought, good Lord, good Lord. I was ready to go, leave it on my pants. I don't care. <laughs> If I have to clean it, I mean, they, we can wash them later. But anyways, it was eggnog everywhere. But anyways, uh, some of it was at my house that day. It was tragic. So I was sad about the eggnog. So, but no, that's the gift of serving. Maybe you have that gift, the gift of serving. You would jump immediately. Then some would say this. Listen, I'll buy you another apple pie. I'll buy you another apple pie. In fact... Buy apple pies for everyone at the table. Everyone at the table. Let's celebrate. In fact, look at that shirt of yours. I'll get you a new shirt. I'll get you a new shirt. Maybe you have the gift of giving. The gift of giving. You want to make that right. And you have the ability. And you want to make that right. I'll, I'll listen. Listen. It's easy to solve. Everybody relax. Throw that shirt away. I'll get you a new one. You go pick it out. I'll pay for it. So... Some of the problem is that you don't want others to see you with that gift of giving. You do it anonymously. You don't want others to see you give. But in that case, you're buying a round of apple pies. I'll take one. You're buying, yes. Yeah, Emmy says she will too. So this is just a story. But honestly, that's the gift of giving. Then others would say this. Maybe you have the gift of giving. Now, others would say this, don't worry, listen, do not worry about that pile over you. Uh, I get, get, get this organized. We can get this organized in about two minutes. Get this organized in about two minutes. Get this, you get that, straighten up. No, come on, get, stay, look, give me your towel. Uh, get, give that server your towel. And they'll clean it up and that type of thing. Uh, we'll have this cleaned up in no time. Come on, let's go. Let's get it together and let's get it going. So that's the gift of leadership or administration. 
someone to organize people and put people together. The gift of or, uh, uh, leadership or organization uh, uh, or the gift of administration. So then someone would say this. Another person with a different gift would say this. Don't worry about that mess. <laughs> Don't you even worry about that mess. <laughs> I dropped the whole plate of spaghetti on the carpet the other day. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. I'm the, that, that's nothing what you just did. That pie won't even stay. Don't you worry about that. Listen, help, help him clean up, server. Help him. Help him clean up and you just listen. Everybody makes mistakes. Don't you give it another thought. Listen, I'm a mess. I'm always knocking things over. You're way, listen, you're way better than me. No matter how you slice it, you're way better than me. Listen, you have the gift of encouragement. <laughs> you're trying to take the tension off everything. You have the gift of encouragement, maybe. And that's what you would do. You wouldn't be first to jump in. You would be first to encourage that person that it's not that big of a deal what you did. You have the gift of encouragement. You desire to make others feel better. And then this. Then this. There are those who would say, Oh, I hurt with you. You have that pile over you. I hurt with you. One time I dropped, I dropped some sauce on my leg and everybody laughed at me. I hurt with you. Now folks, please know I don't have that gift. <laughs> I need a little more of that. I don't have that gift. You've got the gift of kindness. You're empathetic and you're great to be with. You have the gift of kindness. Who in their right mind doesn't want kind people in their life? You need that. I need that. I need that. Then some then another person with another gift would say this, you know, that pie should have never been sitting that close to the edge. I have a chart with seven steps to serving apple pie. In the Greek, the Greek word for apple is kookabaka. <laughs> you have the gift of teaching. You would have researched apple pie and how to serve it well. The gift of teaching. You'd get online and just see all kinds of things. You have the gift of teaching. Then lastly, some would say this. Who set that pie close to the edge? That's about as dumb as it gets. Set that pie close to the edge. This is a truth. This, this, this person is a truth teller, and someone has to say it. They're compelled to say it. It's the prophet. No one is saying it. Everybody's jumping. It's going to happen again if someone doesn't say this. It's the truth teller. Everybody has low tolerance for the truth teller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite often confronted with that. I have the gift of the prophet, and I'm, I don't care how you slice it. You have to be careful how you talk. I don't care. It just comes up and I have to I want to say it but you have to say it nicely or you hurt people so I uh, we were in a steering team meeting yesterday and uh, I turned to Lou it came right out of my mouth I turned to Lou Luftig Robin's husband and I said uh, Lou something like what's wrong with you <laughs> didn't you hear everybody else making the comments they already told you the answer, and you still say you don't understand. So what do we got to do, like, to make you understand? Afterwards, the Spirit of God said, you got a big, fat mouth. And honestly, Lou's not here today. I'm, he's sick, but I couldn't wait to see him in the hallway to give him a hug, say, I'm sorry. I'm going to apologize as a group next time we meet. But uh, honestly, even the gift of the prophet, you got a big mouth, so... Say it nicely. Say it nicely. It takes no effort whatsoever for me to say it wrongly, which is bad, which is bad. So, nonetheless, so uh, the one with the gift of the prophet tells the truth. You deserve to have that pie 
the prophet would say, well, you deserve to have that pie in your lap. Whoa. It was that close to you. Are you dumb? <laughs> That's probably not a good thing to say. The one with kindness would say, oh, how could you speak that way? And I'm saying, well, I don't know. I just did. <laughs> your notes are... But nonetheless, it's not right. I mean, you have to filter everything. Filter everything. So nonetheless, folks, every Christ follower has a spiritual gift, <coughs> and God wants you to serve in some capacity using your gift to reach our world for Christ. Listen, in your notes, number one, God calls you to serve in his church. In his church. Folks, loads of you do that very thing. Do that. I've never seen a church, honestly, I've never been a part of a church that so many people are involved in ministry. It's tons of folks. Almost everybody is a part of something. You say, someone would say, well, what do they do? I could name it. I could name it. They say, well, well what do they do? What does Scott Weber do? You know why the grass looks so beautiful? Crap, did you cut the grass this week? Yeah. I said, when did you cut it? Thursday? I was going to say, he must have looked at the weather and saw that we have a monsoon coming. <laughs> and he cut it Thursday. I drove past and I went, oh my goodness, look how beautiful that is. It's like a golf course. So, but someone would say, well, what do they do? What do they do? How do they do? What do they do? I'd be able to say, in most cases, I would be able to say, right here, our church is loaded with people that serve, do something for the Lord Jesus Christ, even the teens. I asked the teens this morning, I said, get an umbrella. Would you, we have four umbrellas. Would you guys go out and rescue people from the cars and, you know, so they're not soaked and drowned by the time they get here? And they said, they didn't say, oh, we're playing pool. <laughs> Grabbed the umbrellas and lined up at the door. Now, they were all wrestling, hitting each other with umbrellas. Out there. <laughs> so that goes along with everything else. So open them up. So when they come in, they're all wet. Open them up and in people's faces. And, but that kind of goes along. Like 50-year-old men wouldn't do that. So, but, well, maybe Paul would. But, anyways, but, uh, yes. but nonetheless, that's just what you get. But honestly, even the teens, honestly, they're coming. They, many of them will come on work day and they'll work hard. And it's just we have a spirit of serving here at Lighthouse. It is thrilling. I've heard pastors say all the time, you know, about, you know, 20% of our people are involved. And I say, I don't even want to mess around with them or even belittle what they think or what they say. Uh, but I want to tell them probably 80% of our people, 85% of our people are involved in something. That's a huge, huge percentage in church that are doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. You use your gifts and abilities to serve in this church honestly we talk about that that child evangelism fellowship in starting in october we have four people that said i'd be willing to do that i'd like to do that with a team it's four people so can you even imagine that i just four people they're going to go to rutherford elementary school dolphin county uh just in uh, central dolphin and 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 teach the gospel to kids that come from all over kids to go to school so it's it's astounding really it is it's wonderful so but uh that's number one god wants you to serve in his church build each other up then number two it's a short one and we'll close with this number two in your notes god calls you to serve as his church as his church jesus said this to his followers in matthew chapter 5 verse 14 he said you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. It's referring to the light that's in you that you are in this world. Instead, they put it on a lampstand, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, the light that is in you from Christ that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. This is last page. Folks, 
if you carry the name of Jesus. If you don't, this is not for you. If you carry the name of Jesus, we are called to let the light of Christ shine wherever and whatever we do. Let the light of Christ shine wherever and whatever we do, that your world may see your good works. All to the glory, all to glorify your Father in heaven. Folks, we exist to reach our world for Christ. We exist for that. So whatever you do with your gifts and abilities, all designed to encourage others, other believers, and to reach our world for Christ. If you have Christ, you are the light of this world, the light that lights your life. Pam, will you go ahead and roll that clip last time? your light shine to this world the end let's close in prayer father we love you i ask you lord as we think about value number two about being consumers or giving back giving back what we've been given Lord, you've called us to take our gifts and abilities to serve you and serve in the church, which you died for the church, Lord. I ask you, Lord, there's one here today who would say, honestly, Pastor, I really, I, I'd have to just reshuffle the deck, but I want to. I want to serve my Lord at even greater greater heights I want to do all those things and use my gifts and abilities to serve my king Lord you know the hearts of people thank you for how good you are to us thank that you have thank you that you have brought people our way and moved their hearts to use their gifts and abilities to reach this crazy world for Christ and for us to do our part in this strategic part of the world in the United States. Help us, Lord. There's one here today that does not know you as their Savior, Lord. Today be the day, or even this week, if they'd give me a call, I would meet with them and even share with them the steps to take to know you as Savior. Please do that, Lord. If someone needs prayer, Lord, in the next few moments, would they just slip from your seat? There are people down front that will pray with them and encourage them. Help us, Lord. Help us to use what you have given us for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to close with the last song.